<clears throat> this morning, um, we're going to begin for Cain and Abel and how that connects with the law of God in Leviticus and therefore then how that applies to us as Christians. So you'll need to pay careful attention, um, but I know you can do that. So listen again to the, to the curse and the promise of the gospel from Genesis chapter 3. So in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve have sinned. And the Lord God said to the serpent in Genesis 3, Because you have done this, cursed are you above all livestock and above all beasts of the field. On your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and her offspring. He shall bruise your head and you shall bruise his heel. To the woman, he said, I will surely multiply your pain and childbearing. In pain, you shall bring forth children. Your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And to Adam, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree of which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In pain you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you. And you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face you shall eat bread till you return to the ground. For out of it you were taken. For you are dust and to dust you shall return. The man called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. And the Lord God made for Adam and for his wife garments of skins and clothed them. Thus it was at the, it was at the edge of the Garden of Eden that the Lord himself provided a, a substitutionary sacrifice to cover the sin and shame of Adam and Eve. And it was this sacrifice which gave us a glimpse. It pointed forward to a, a true and better sacrifice to come. A true and better substitute covering all of our sin and shame. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Well, as I mentioned a couple of weeks ago, um, in the very next generation from this, this idea of a substitute, uh, of a substitutionary sacrificial atonement payment for sin uh, was observed by Abel, but it was abandoned by Cain. Genesis chapter 4 verses 3 to 5 tells us the story. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought to the Lord an offering of the fruit of the ground, and Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat portions. And the Lord had regard for Abel in his offering. But for Cain in his offering, he had no regard. So Cain was very angry and his face fell. Well, implied there in those few verses is that not only did Abel bring the animal sacrifice for a burnt offering to cover his sin, but it, but it seems that he also brought some of the first fruits, whereas Cain only brought an offering of the fruit of the ground, it says. Herein lies the problem with Cain's offering. The, the Scottish pastor Andrew Bonar, he, he writes this, and he calls what we will call the grain offering, he calls it a meal offering. But, but this is what he writes. He says, it may have been acceptable as a meal offering if it had been founded upon the slain lamb and had followed as a consequence from that sacrifice. But the statement of Hebrews 11.4 lets us know that Cain had not faith in the seed of the woman. Therefore, his offering was hateful to God. So Hebrews 11.4 says this, by faith. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain, through which he was commended as righteous. God commending him by accepting his gifts, and through his faith, though he died, he still speaks. So Cain's attempt 
was to present himself and his offering to God as if he was not under a curse. And therefore, he needed no blood sacrifice. He needed no atonement for sin. And yet, as the scriptures will tell us later, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. For the wages of sin is death. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But God, but God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Again, Andrew Bonar connecting this to us. He says of Cain and his offering. He says he sought to be accepted by his holiness and so overthrow salvation by Christ. His holiness, his good works. And then he goes on to make this connection. He says acts of charity substituted for Christ's work as a means of pacifying the conscience make up precisely this sin of Cain. Nor are they less mistaken who think by by self-denial and by doing good to others in their life and conduct to obtain favor and therefore be accepted with God. This is offering the meal offering ere the man has been cleansed by the burnt offering. It's putting sanctification before justification. And there's a tendency to this error in those books or those false teachers, he writes, which recommend anxious souls that are not yet come to Christ to draw up a form of self-dedication and solemnly give themselves to the Lord. These counselors are in danger of leading souls past the blood of the Lamb and of putting their meal offerings too hastily into their hands. In other words, you cannot buy or otherwise earn your salvation through good works or even high-dollar donations. You must come through the blood of the Lamb. Let's read together Leviticus chapter 2, and keep in mind as we do, um, as we read this, that this follows the instructions regarding the, the construction of the tabernacle, which happens at the end of the book of Exodus, the tabernacle, the house of worship, the tent of meeting. It also follows in Leviticus chapter 1, the instructions of the burnt offerings that we looked at a couple of weeks ago. So let's read Leviticus chapter 2. When anyone brings a grain offering or a meal offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it and bring it to Aaron's sons, the priests. And he shall take from it a handful of fine flour and oil with all of its frankincense And the priest shall burn this as a memorial portion on the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and for his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. Then you shall bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an when you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. And if your offering is a grain offering baked on a griddle, It shall be a fine flour, unleavened, mixed with oil. You shall break it in pieces and pour oil on it. It is a grain offering. And if your offering is a grain offering cooked in a pan, it shall be made of fine flour with oil. And you shall bring the grain offering that is made of these things to the Lord. And when it is presented to the priest, he shall bring it to the altar. And the priest shall take from the grain offering its memorial portion and burn this in the altar, a food offering with a pleasing aroma to the Lord. But the rest of the grain offering shall be for Aaron and his sons. It is a most holy part of the Lord's food offerings. No grain offering that you bring to the Lord shall be made with leaven. For you shall burn no leaven nor any honey as a food offering to the Lord. As an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord. But they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma. You shall season all of your grain offerings with salt. And uh, you shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offerings. With all your offerings, you shall offer salt. 
If you offer a grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer uh, for the grain offerings of your first fruits, fresh ears, roasted with fire, crushed new grain. And you shall put oil on it and lay frankincense on it. It is a grain offering. And the priest shall burn as a, its memorial portion some of the crushed grain and some of the oil with all its frankincense. It is a food offering to the Lord. Let's stop and ask the Lord to help us. Lord, we, uh, we do need your help. We need your spirit to work through your word, to give us ears to hear, to help us to understand. Father, I pray that I would decrease, that Christ would increase, that his name would be glorified. We pray this in your name, in Jesus' name, amen. So a couple of weeks ago, um, as we looked at chapter one, we looked at the regulations regarding those, those burnt offerings. And we saw that in order for the people to approach God in worship, in order for them to ascend his holy hill, as Psalm 24 says, they must have clean hands and a pure heart. And so they must come with an offering of body and blood to cover their sins. And so we learned about the, the ritual of the burnt offering. As it says at the beginning of chapter 1, he shall bring it to the entrance of the tent of meeting that he may be accepted by the Lord. Now it's fitting for those who have been accepted by God through this substitutionary atonement to therefore then express their dedication and devotion to him. And so this is the relationship between the burnt offerings of chapter 1 and the, and the meal or the grain offerings of chapter 2. And so this grain offering is an acknowledgement. It's an acknowledgement that, that everything that the worshiper owns, everything that he reaped from the fields, everything that he possessed belonged to God. And so now a, a portion of that was to be given back to God as an expression of, of faith and dedication, as well as a recognition of his, of his thankfulness, because God is the source of all things, and he's the one that provides all that we have and need. The New Testament epistle of James puts it like this. He says, every good gift and every perfect gift is from above coming down from the Father of lights, with whom there is no variation or shadow due to change. Of his own will, he brought us forth by the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. So generally, this grain offering would be brought in conjunction with the burnt offering. So we see this, for example, um, in 1 Kings chapter 8, when Solomon is dedicating the, the newly built temple, which would take the place of the portable tabernacle. He offered up both kinds of offerings, burnt offerings and grain offerings. But there were also times when it would be brought by itself, and, but not burned on the altar, rather just given. So, for example, when the, when the first crops were gathered at harvest, notice down in verse 12, it says, as an offering of first fruits, you may bring them to the Lord, but they shall not be offered on the altar for a pleasing aroma, not, not burned and consumed. Now, later, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, verses 1 to 4, um, the Lord will give us some more detail of this law, how this will play out particularly for after the people of Israel were to enter the promised land. So Deuteronomy 26 verses 1 to 4 says this, When you come into the land that the Lord your God is giving you for an inheritance, and have taken possession of it and live in it, you shall take some of the first of all the fruit of the ground which you harvest from your land that the Lord your God is giving you. And you shall put it in a basket and go to the place that the Lord your God will choose to make his name to dwell there, to park the tabernacle, in other words. And you shall go to the priest who is in the office at that time and say to him, I declare today to the Lord your God that I have come into the land that the Lord swore to our fathers to give us. Then the priest shall take the basket from your hand and set it down before the altar of the Lord your God. This is an offering of the first fruits. It's an acknowledgement that the, that the Lord has fulfilled his promises. He has brought them into the, the promised land. And, and, and first fruits, we kind of went through this before, 
First fruits means primary. It means the best, not the leftovers. Now zoom back out for just a moment. I want you to notice that these, these first three offerings here in the book of Leviticus, um, the burnt offering of chapter 1, the grain offering here in chapter 2, and then the peace offering in chapter 3, they're all, they're all soothing or, or pleasant aroma offerings. And yet this grain offering is, is different from the other two in that it's not an animal that's burnt on the altar. It's also different from the burnt offering of chapter 1 in that only a handful is burned. The rest actually becomes food for the priests. So consider this. Those who have been reconciled to God and now have access into his presence, they will regularly acknowledge that they owe everything to God. See, dedication or devotion is the right and necessary consequence of atonement. Dedication or devotion is the right and necessary consequence of atonement, of being forgiven of our sins. Now, there's two ways to view the law, two ways to view this law specifically. We could view it in a positive way or a negative way. So negatively, you could read the law and conclude that the Lord requires his people to offer themselves and, and the best that they have as a token of their dedication and gratitude. And that's true. Sometimes we forget that the law is actually law. <laughs> but to read this in a maybe a more charitable or more positive way, we could conclude that those who are loyally dedicated to the covenant God has made with his people will offer themselves and the best that they have to the Lord, and they will do this with joyful, happy hearts. This is the difference between a child who obeys, because I told you so, because there will be dire consequences if you don't, and obeying because I love you. Because they love mother and father and they want to please them, to make them happy, to make them proud. This sacrifice involves a, a thankful Israelite worshiper. And it gives him a way to express his thankfulness to God for the atonement for sin. See, atonement, forgiveness of sin, it prompts a response of worship. It, it, it ought to anyway, right? Forgiveness of sin ought to prompt a response of worship. And so here in Leviticus chapter 2, we can see the guidelines for the proper way to do this according to the law of God. And so the first thing to remember as we work through this, as you consider this law, is that this is a demonstration of dedication. This is a demonstration of dedication. So again, if we were to put this into, into one simple sentence, um, I would say something like this. The Lord desires that his people demonstrate their devotion to him by offering a, a token, a, a portion of their substance, of their stuff. You've probably noticed that, as we read through this, that like he does in chapter 1, like we read in chapter 1, there's a detailed repetition throughout this chapter. So, so look at verse 1. When anyone brings a grain offering as an offering to the Lord, his offering shall be of fine flour. He shall pour oil on it and put frankincense on it. Jump down to verse 4. When you bring a grain offering baked in the oven as an offering, it shall be an unleavened loaves of fine flour mixed with oil or unleavened wafers smeared with oil. Jump down now to verse 14. If your grain offering of first fruits to the Lord, you shall offer for the grain offering of your first fruits fresh ears roasted with fire, crushed new grain. There's a, there's a detailed repetition, yet there's also variety within that sort of repetition. These grain offerings, so they could be in the form of uncooked flour, verses 1 to 3. Different types of cooked bread, verses 4 to 10. 
Or they could be various types of roasted grain, as in verses 14 to 16. They were to always contain oil, sometimes frankincense, and salt seems to be very important. We'll come back to that. But first, I want us to see the connection here to how we worship in all of this. We could start with this statement. God's people are to pay tribute to him. God's people are to pay tribute to him. Now, like with the burnt offering, this law begins by stating this, anyone may come. Back in Exodus chapter 40, um, the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, was erected, was put together and established. And the, and the sons of Aaron, that is the, the priests, were consecrated for the work that would take place there. But at first, here, it, it seems as though any one of the people of Israel may bring offerings. Now, later, in the book of Numbers, this will be severely restricted due to the sin of the people. But for now, the law simply says, anyone. And that's a very specific Hebrew word there in verse 1. And it means, and, and this is where it really gets interesting, the, word, the Hebrew word there that's translated anyone, it means anyone. Anyone. God uses this word specifically to emphasize that he desires the dedication of all all of his people, both men and women, all of his people. Now, I, I alluded to this earlier maybe, but depending on which version of the Bible you have, the law here might call this a grain offering. It might translate it a, a meal offering. There's a few translations that even say a cereal offering. In fact, in the King James Version, with its Old English, it calls this, it actually calls this the meat offering. Now, obviously, meat there in King James has a different meaning for us because in this offering, there is no meat. Um, probably the word meat evolved somehow into the word meal, the meal offering. But this is offered generally in conjunction with the meat of the burnt offering. And most of the men in here know that it's not a meal without the meat. <laughs> Did you say amen? <laughs> at, at any rate, the ESV that I use, the English Standard Version, translate this as grain offering. And the word grain there, or meal or meat, whichever word is translated, it actually means a tribute or a donation. It means that this is a, this is a bloodless sacrifice. And so in Genesis chapter 32, verse 13... The same word is used for the gift that, that Jacob sends to Esau in order to appease him. In fact, I think it's called a present there. And he needs to appease him because Jacob had taken advantage of Esau and stolen his birthright. But it's also used in 1 Kings chapter 4, verse 21. And I think this gets at the, at the meaning that we can see here. 1 Kings 4.21 says, Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms from the Euphrates to the land of the Philistines and to the border of Egypt. They, that is the kingdoms that he was ruling over, brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Tribute. Most of the time that we see that word, uh, that word used, the word for gift or tribute or present, it's given in order to, to ease some fear to ease some uncertainty. So, so Jacob was afraid of e what Esau would do to him when they crossed paths because Esau had threatened to kill him. These lesser kingdoms, they were afraid of, of what the powerful king Solomon would do to them. And so they sent tributes in order to, to win over his favor, to express their, their loyalty and their dedication to their covenant agreements, to their treaties. The same is true for us. The Lord requires his people, those who were bought by the blood of Christ, to express our loyalty and our dedication to him. So the psalmist in Psalm 95 says this in verses 2 to 6, Let us come into his presence with thanksgiving. 
Let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise. For the Lord is a great God and a great king above all gods. In his hands are the depths of the earth. The heights of the mountains are his also. The sea is his for he made it and his hands formed the dry land. O come, let us bow down and worship. Let us kneel before the Lord, our maker. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, also gets at this when, when Peter writes this. He says, but you are a, a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. God's people are to pay tribute to him as a demonstration of their dedication to proclaim the excellencies of the one who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So what is this tribute? What is this tribute that we are to pay well, it, here in Leviticus, it's to be a portion of their substance. And by substance, we could say the good things that God has provided them. Normally in the law, as we read through this, it was simply to be a mixture of flour and oil, which would sometimes be brought cooked, sometimes uncooked, and sometimes with frankincense on it. Verse 1, we can see that if this was brought uncooked, and you can actually see this throughout the chapter, it was to be made with fine flour. Fine flour. Now, that's, that's interesting, actually. In Ezekiel chapter 16, the Lord uses that same term, fine flour, in a metaphor of his description, his own description of what he has done, the Lord has done for his bride. Now, listen very carefully to Ezekiel chapter 16. I'm going to read just verses 10 to 14. So this is the Lord speaking metaphorically of his bride. He says, I clothed you with embroidered cloth, shod you with fine leather. I wrapped you in fine linen and covered you with silk. I adorned you with ornaments and put bracelets on your wrists and a chain on your neck. And I put a ring in your nose and earrings in your ears with a beautiful crown on your head. Thus you were adorned with gold and silver, and your clothing was of fine linen and silk and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour and honey and oil. You grew exceedingly beautiful and advanced to royalty. And your renown went forth among the nations because of your beauty for it was perfect, the splendor that I had bestowed on you, declares the Lord God. Now, does the metaphor of the Lord and his bride ring any bells? It should. Because Paul tells us specifically in the book of Ephesians that marriage is a picture of the relationship between Christ and his church. And did you hear that, that connection there in Ezekiel with the, the finer things, the luxuries of life? Fine leather, embroidered linen, silk, gold and silver, jewelry, and also fine flour? In other words, fine flour was valuable. It was on par with those other luxuries there. And here in Leviticus chapter 2, it likely represents those who are redeemed, those whom the Lord delivered from their slavery in Egypt. Now, I could also point out that oil is often used in the scripture for anointing. Um, it's used in setting apart. For example, it's used in consecrating a shepherd boy to be the king. And so when we see this offering, when we read about these elements here, when we read about a portion being set apart to the Lord, consumed by fire on the altar, we should be reminded that the redeemed have themselves been set apart. We've been refined as by fire, even. 
Zechariah chapter 13 verse 9 says, And I will put this third into the fire and refine them as one refined silver and test them as gold is tested. They will call upon my name and I will answer them. I will say they are my people and they will say the Lord is my God. God's people have been set apart, have been consecrated to the Lord. Romans 12.1 I appeal to you, therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. The frankincense. Frankincense gives this offering its pleasant aroma. Um, according to the Mishnah, which is a collection of rabbinical teachings on the law, sort of a commentary, um, while the priests made this offering on the altar, the people would gather outside for prayer. So the, 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 the pleasant aroma of the burning of the incense would become linked in the, in the Jewish people's mind with the prayers of the saints. John's vision of heavenly worship in Revelation chapter 8, verses 3 and 4, it says this, And another angel came and stood at the altar, with a golden censer, and he was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all the saints on the golden altar before the throne. And the smoke of the incense with the prayers of the saints rose before God from the hand of the angel. So can you see in these offerings how important our worship is to God? We will often pray that our worship would rise as a pleasant aroma. Our prayers rise as a pleasanter. When we sing songs, we're, we're praying. You know that, right? When we're singing songs, we're, we're praying to God. When we gather together, when I pray, do a longish pastoral prayer, that's us praying. It's not just me. It's us. It's the church, God's people, praying to God, asking him to work. In fact, verses 12 and 14, we can even see Leviticus 2, 12 and 14. We can see the connection to the first fruits, the first and the best. That's what the Lord wants. He wants a demonstration of our dedication to him. And he wants it to rise as a pleasant aroma. And this continues because it's also to be corruption free and faithful. Corruption free and faithful. Now, this is where the, the restrictions and the qualifications for the offering come in that we can see throughout this chapter. So specifically, we're, we're kind of talking about verses 4 to 7 and then verses 11 to 13 primarily. And when, when we understand that each of the elements of this offering, so the fine flour, the oil, the frankincense, etc., each of them point to a reality now. And so the Lord wants our offerings to be corruption-free and faithful. So if the flour and oil were cooked like bread, it was to be brought without leaven, it says. Now, again, we've talked about this before um, when we were studying 1 Corinthians, but the, the leaven in the Bible, um, it was not like the yeast that we have today, which is processed and all of that. Um, it was more like sourdough starter. So we're talking about, when it talks about leaven, we're, we're actually talking about the fermentation process. And at this point in the narrative, at this point in what's happening here, the Lord really doesn't say why this offering is to be brought without leaven, just that it is, right? He doesn't explain what the leaven represents. Well, later in the New Testament, specifically, we can see that leaven represents that infestation of sin. In fact, Paul will say more than once, a little leaven leavens the whole lump. And he's talking about sin spreading and infecting the entire church. Now, think about this for a moment. It was perfectly normal in the normal course of Israelite life. It was perfectly normal for people making various types of bread for their own dinner, bread for their own sandwiches, to decide for themselves if leaven or salt was needed for the recipe. It was perfectly normal. There's nothing inherently wrong or sinful 
about leaven, about sourdough starter. Praise God for that, right? It's pretty good. The law is about the spiritual reality. It's always about the heart and what was going on in the heart of mankind. See, we all know that uh, what leaven or what that fermentation process does to dough, right? It spreads and it expands. It, it rises and it changes the composition of the finished product. And since they were really offering up themselves, the real picture here is that they were not to offer up themselves with their own malice and wickedness and guilt. Remember, who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false, does not swear deceitfully. These laws are pointing to this. God desires dedication without corruption. There's another ingredient in this list here that's also prohibited. Honey. Now the word can also actually be translated nectar. So it might be honey, like from bees. It also might be um, the nectar of fruit. Either way, this is referring to natural sugars that act as activators and accelerants for the leaven. Let me tell you, I think the reason why this is prohibited is because sweet and flattering speech can certainly spread up, uh, speed up the spread of sin, right? I, I know it can in my heart. Sweet and flattering speech can spread up, I said it again, speed up the spread of of sin in our own hearts. You may be able to sweet talk your way into a church, even into leadership, but you cannot sweet talk your way into the throne of grace. I think that's the point here. When I was studying this, I was thinking of honey in the book of Proverbs. I thought, well, honey must be bad. It must be wrong. But throughout the rest of the Bible, whenever honey is brought up, it's actually almost always a positive thing, a good thing. And if it's, we're talking about speech here, if we're talking about what is coming out of our mouths, which is really in our hearts, it can be encouragement. But God desires dedication without corruption. And he also desires covenant faithfulness. So look at verse 13. This is, I think, one of the most fascinating verses in this chapter. Verse 13 says, You shall season all your grain offerings with salt. You shall not let the salt of the covenant with your God be missing from your grain offering. With all your offerings you shall offer salt. So three times in one verse he mentions salt. And he even uses the phrase, the salt of the covenant. It seems that the Lord likes his people to be a little salty. Now this phrase, the salt of the covenant, or a covenant of salt, it's actually used a few other times in the Old Testament. It's used in Numbers 18, verse 19, where in that verse it is clearly referring to this same covenant with Moses, the Mosaic covenant covenant, the law, the Sinai covenant. But it's also used in 2 Chronicles chapter 13, verse 5. And Abijah uses this, the king of Judah, and he's going into battle against Jeroboam, the king of Israel. So the nation has divided two kingdoms. They have two different kings. They're going into battle against each other. And Abijah, the king of Judah, says this to Jeroboam. He says, Ought you not know that the Lord God of Israel gave the kingship over Israel forever to David and his sons by a covenant of salt? Now he's saying there that he is the rightful heir to the throne. But the point I'm making is that the scriptures refer to both the Mosaic and the Davidic covenants as a covenant of salt. Let 
So the image of salt is connected here somehow. Salt is a preservative. We actually read this in Matthew 5 earlier. So this image is emphasizing really the durability of the covenants. This is about covenant faithfulness. Faithfulness. God will never forsake them. He had promised uh, when he made this covenant with the nation back in chapter Exodus chapter 19 verses 5 and 6, God said this, now therefore, if you will indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession among all peoples, for all the earth is mine, and you shall be to me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And a couple verses later, it says, And all the people answered together and said, All that the Lord has spoken, we will do. God promised to never forsake them. And they promised, they covenanted to obey him and all the words of his law. And it got to the point by the end of the Old Testament that all they were bringing to him in worship, all the sacrifices that they were bringing, it was only leaven. They were only bringing to him wickedness and iniquity and sin. And so he would declare through the prophet Amos, he says, Is not the day of the Lord darkness and not light and gloom with no brightness in it? I hate, I despise your feasts. I take no delight in your solemn assemblies. Even though you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. The peace offerings of your fattened animals, I will not look upon them. Take away from me the noise of your songs. To the melody of your harps, I will not listen. But let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. All they were offering him, they were going through the motions, right? They were bringing animals they were bringing the grain offerings, the burnt offerings, the grain offerings, the peace offerings. They were bringing the offerings, but their heart was far from him. And he says, I hate it. I despise your worship. Get it out of here. But then he says at the end of this, when he says he's not going to listen to their songs, he's not going to listen to the melody of their harps, he says, but let justice roll down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. Do you know how that last part happens? Justice and righteousness? It's because he has made us a truer and better burnt offering in Christ. A better covenant of salt. In, in fact, speaking of the law, in Matthew 5, we read this earlier, Jesus said this, you are the salt of the earth. If salt has lost its taste, how shall its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet. This law, because they were bringing essentially only leaven, only malice and wickedness to God, was thrown out and trampled under people's feet. It wasn't good for anything. Stop doing it, he says. In the same way, Jesus continues, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. As we read through that in Matthew chapter 5, it doesn't sound like good news. Because it's actually not. It's the law. The good news is that the, the offering Christ made on our behalf was accepted once and for all time. For our sake, he made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. And so now, we are able to approach the Lord clothed with Christ's righteousness. And we may therefore demonstrate our dedication to him with the, the faithfulness of one whose name is faithful and true. As Christians, we, we are called to be the salt of the earth, to be faithful to his commands, to let our light shine before others so that they may see our good deeds, our corruption-free and faithful offerings, and glorify the Father in heaven. 
To follow our king's commands is to reflect our king's character. To follow our king's commands is to offer up our dedication to him in such a way so that the world may see and give glory to the king. To our capital K king. And to live like this is to live in such a way that our offerings of worship rise to the Lord as a memorial portion, a pleasing aroma. The significance of this offering for us is this. As Christians, those who have trusted in Christ for salvation, we have received complete atonement for sin through the body and blood of Christ. And so we confess that we are not our own, but we've been bought with a price. And therefore, we make it our aim to glorify God in everything we do. That it might be said of us, as Paul said of the Philippians, for example, the gifts you sent, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God. The law points us to Christ always. On our own, we cannot obey these things. Even the motivation of coming without leaven, without wickedness and malice and sin. Even why we come when we assemble to worship. And yet because of Christ, our offerings rise as a pleasant aroma giving glory to the Father in heaven. Pray with me. Father, I pray that even, the, even in the um, your law is sometimes difficult to understand. It's difficult to understand what all of these details mean, but we know that it points at something, that it points at the heart, that you desire our hearts. You desire who we are and not just our sacrifices, not just our offerings. So our prayer today, Lord, is that we would understand these things, that we would understand the depth of the sacrifice of Jesus as the, as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And for all who call upon him would be saved. For those who, who believe in him, you have given the right to be called children of God, that we may approach you in worship, that we don't have to come with flour and oil and salt. We don't have to come with burnt offerings of animals and sacrifices that we can come based on Christ. And so, Father, as we come to the table, Lord, we proclaim his death until he returns. We proclaim that Christ died to save sinners, among whom I am the foremost. We come to proclaim that in him is life, life everlasting. Father, we come to proclaim that Jesus is King. We pray these things in his name. Amen.